All right. So 25% of the of, of people and families in Utah that became homeless in the last five years are have a disabling condition. That means that there are a lot of parents who are either dealing with a disability of their own or have a child with disabilities. And, and I think that uh, it's important when looking at how families become homeless that we look at that uh, in this series of three webinars about families with homelessness and the families who become homeless, families experiencing homelessness and the factors that contribute to that. We've been looking at it through the lens of uh, two hypothetical families, which I will read right now. Uh, the first hypothetical family is a family headed by a 25 year old single mother who separated from her husband when he was arrested for domestic violence. Her two children are, oh, well, okay. Um, Levy, you, um, we got started with the next part of the agenda. Can you go last? Uh, sure, that would be fine. Sorry, I just was barely able to slip away from something at work. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, okay, a family, so the first hypothetical family that we've been looking at in these webinars is a family headed by a 25-year-old single mother who was separated from her husband when he was arrested for domestic violence. Her two children are aged three and five. She's been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. She also has a back condition that makes her unable to lift more than 30 pounds. Her family became homeless after she lost her job because her employer felt she was taking too many days off from work to take care of sick children. Uh, the second hypothetical family is a family headed by a 23-year-old 23 23-year-old single father with one two-year-old child. He became homeless for the first time when he was 12 with his mother. He entered the foster care system when he was 16, but unfortunately left foster care without completing a high school diploma. He learned he was a parent when he was 21 years old and managed to make monthly child care payments of $300 while living in an apartment he shared with two coworkers from his job in retail. His daughter was placed in his custody after her mother was incarcerated. They became homeless shortly, shortly thereafter. Um, we're gonna start looking um, at disability status and, and um, in, in the, by hearing from Melissa Hanchen, and just um, from the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition talking about uh, how disability status is, is, uh, is uh, how domestic violence and disability status. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Bill. And yeah, my last name is a bit of a toughie. It's got a silent letter in there. My name is Melissa Henshin, and I am project manager with Utah Domestic Violence Coalition. I think I probably have the ability to share my screen. I did bring a, a short PowerPoint to, to guide us along. Yeah. Oh, has disabled. I can use it as my own guide if I can't share it with everybody. <laughs> Just let me know. I can always send it to you all afterwards so you have it for reference as well. No problem at all. Um, I yeah. just made you a co-host. I think you should. Oh, you send me? It. All right. Yeah. Let me try again. Oh, there it is. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. So let me just play this slideshow. Okay, so yeah, I'm thrilled to be able to be with you all today and be part of this discussion and specifically talking about how domestic violence is impacting individuals with disabilities. And so our focus is generally on adults and how that affects the family structure. So I'm going to talk about it in that way, but I hope that you can think about it um, with also parents who, who have children with disabilities and how that would impact their status in a larger way as well. So uh, I'm going to very briefly walk us through because um, I'm not sure the, the level of, of understanding of um, domestic violence and power of control. So I just want to set that foundation for us really briefly um, and keeping an eye on the time as well. Okay, we're doing great. So we're talking about domestic violence or intimate partner violence. We're talking about uh, power and control and how that can um, occur in a lot of different ways. So we have all kinds of different things and these are just a few common ones that, that you might see, but really there are lots and lots of different ways that someone can exert power and control in a relationship. Um, and it's done, it's a pattern. It's not a one-time event. Um, and there's often like escalation of frequency and severity over time as well. So this you may have seen, this is the, the standard power and control wheel. And again, we're not gonna take time to look at all of these different things. We're gonna revisit this wheel at the end of um, my presentation here in just a few minutes, and it's gonna look a little different. 
But just while we're looking at this, we're looking at some very common forms of how abuse might be used in an intimate relationship. So intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation, minimizing, denying, and blaming um, one's own behavior onto, onto the victim, uh, using children um, to manipulate a situation, uh, economic abuse, using privilege in the relationship, and that's all kinds of different privilege that one can use, um, and coercion and threats. So just kind of a broad strokes. And who is it that we're talking about that experiences domestic abuse? So we're talking specifically about dating partners, married partners, partners who are living together, sharing the same space, um, or this could be a current um, or former relationship as well. So it might be someone who was in a relationship or did live with someone, but it has to be that intimate um, partner piece. So what does this look like specifically when we're talking about a marginalized group and especially within this group of folks who are experiencing disabilities? So along with all of the things that you just saw on the last slide in that power and control wheel, we're talking about additional barriers. So there are still going to be a lot of things that folks who do not have disabilities, who do not belong to a marginalized group, um, these folks are gonna experience those same things. They might be threatened with um, actions or gestures um, or uh, other kinds of threats that might um, intimidate them into doing what the abuser wants them to do. They might still experience emotional, verbal, psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, all of these things that, that anyone in this kind of relationship may experience. But when we're talking about a marginalized community, there's additional risk factors on top of those that one might experience that are unique to their population. And so um, looking at what those heightened risk factors might be, um, looking at the relationship that the, that the victim has with the person who's using the abusive behavior. Um, as you can see here, they may choose not to report out of fear of consequences. So what are those consequences? If this, um, if this person is their caregiver, if this person is a family member, um, how long have they known this person or been in a relationship with them? Uh, that can also really change how they internalize the abuse and what they choose to do about it and if they feel safe to to tell anyone or to go through um, criminal justice steps at any point. Um, unfortunately, we also know that folks in marginalized groups and this um, one we're talking about disabilities in particular do experience domestic violence at higher rates than those who are not living with disabilities. Um, and there's a really great organization out of Colorado called The Initiative, and they have the statistic at the bottom um, that women with disabilities are 40% more likely to be victims of abuse. And when they are experiencing abuse, they report that it's lasts longer than other relationships that um, where folks are not experiencing a disability and that the abuse is more intense. So it's definitely something that we want to be aware of and consider when working with folks in these communities. Additionally, when we're talking about power and control with this community, um, oftentimes healthcare access may be seen as an earned privilege um, and then access to insurance through full-time employment. So that may not be something that the person with disabilities has. They may, but it, they may not. They may rely on their partner. They may rely on their caregiver um, for that healthcare access, um, which it, it impacts the their ability to um, be seen by the doctor, any kind of medications, um, any kind of medical equipment, personal care access, all of these things are may be tied to, to someone else's um, employment or someone else's um, just allowing of that to happen in the relationship. Uh, they may also not have access to affordable transportation or housing or prescriptions, again, due to someone else's um, having those things for them um, or allowing them access to them, you know, taking them to uh, where they need to go, picking up their prescription, dispensing it to them properly and as needed. Um, and when we're thinking about housing as well, what is accessible housing? What is safe housing um, for the variety of disabilities that we could be talking about, whether we're talking about physical disabilities, mental health disabilities, um, temporary disabilities, permanent disabilities, um, brain trauma, like all, there's a, so such a wide range as I'm sure folks in this group are aware of. Um, and so what does safe and um, affordable and accessible housing look like 
for a wide variety of people who may be experiencing different disabilities. Um, and if they were needing to leave their housing situation, if they were ready, um, wanted to seek different housing, where would they go? Their options might be a lot more limited. Um, shelter services may not be accessible to them, may not be safe. Um, may Maybe they technically can get in, but is it going to be something that's going to be um, helpful or um, harmful? So um, some additional specific barriers and considerations. Uh, abusers may have control over assistive technologies or medicine. Um, they may have isolated their victim um, so that, again, they don't have access to um, perhaps ask for help um, or to, to get the help that they need. Um, they may have been told that, you know, no one else can help them. They may feel so dependent um, on their uh, caregiver that they don't even think that, that help is available. They've lost hope. Um, you know, that's probably because of things that they've been told by their abuser that they believe these things. Um, and the abuser may um, be gaslighting them as well, um, especially if it's something that is a, an unseen disability, mental health disabilities. In our um, hypothetical scenario, the mother had depression and PTSD. Um, and so someone, you know, using those conditions that, that aren't obvious, you know, um, to make them feel like they they don't deserve care or they won't be able to access care or that no one will believe them or things like that as well. Uh, and finally, before we revisit our power and control wheel, um, specifically when we're talking about caregivers, um, this is these are very complex relationships, um, definitely make it a lot harder for a lot of folks with disabilities to um, always understand what's going on. Um, there's a lot of, again, things that might be said that the person who's disabled uh, may be internalizing a lot of the abuse um, on what, you know, thinking, what have I done? What, what can I do to make this better? This is my fault, even though that's not true. Um, depending on, you know, how long they've had a relationship with that person, what the, the dependence on that caregiver is, what kind of needs they provide for them, um, just makes it very complicated for, for seeking help, for leaving the relationship. Um, depending on the reliance that they have and how that caregiver uses power and control to maintain um, what, what they want that relationship to look like. Um, and just a reminder that um, you know, vulnerable abuse reporting laws do require any suspected abuse of a, an elder or disabled um, person by a caretaker. So um, those of us who are in helping agencies, if we are encountering this and we think that that might be something that's going on, it is our responsibility to, um, to say something about that. And so the, my last slide here is just revisiting that power and control wheel. Um, this one is specific for um, folks with disabilities. So you're going to see those same um, outer edges, the intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation, minimize, um, justifying and blaming, uh, economic abuse, privilege. This is caregiver privilege and coercion and threats. And down there in the bottom, instead of using children, we see withholding, misusing, or delaying needed supports. And I am happy to send a, a copy of this PowerPoint to Bill for everyone to have a copy of afterward. And then you can really get in and look at this and also follow the, the links in it if you want more information. But looking at this and seeing some, some really specific things um, that might apply to someone who, who has a disability and is being controlled in a relationship, um, you know, mistreating service animals, uh, enforcing a negative reinforcement program or any behavior that the person doesn't consent to, uh, controlling access to friends, family, and neighbors, uh, limiting their employment possibilities because of the caregiver's schedule, um, denying the physical or emotional pain that the person with disabilities is living with, using medication to sedate them for agency convenience, uh, using the property or the money that they're getting for their disability for the um, the caregiver's benefit, uh, treating the person as a child, a servant, um, threatening to, with, to hurt someone or withhold basic support and rights. These are another just a couple um, different examples, but as you can see, there's many, many ways um, beyond kind of what we generally think of where someone might be um, additionally like well, trapped, <laughs> feel really trapped in a relationship. Um, you can think too, if, if you've got parents, but you've got a kiddo who has um, disabilities, it's going to be really similar with if you have someone who's using control um, and using that child's disability um, as a way to, to control the parent, the, the protective parent who is trying to take care of them. 
Um, so again, just kind of thinking a little broader when we're seeing folks who are who are homeless, when we're seeing folks who maybe there's some red flags and we don't always understand what's going on, um, that there's a lot going on beyond the surface that we don't usually see. And there's a lot of different ways that someone can use power and control um, in any relationship, but especially when we're thinking about disabilities um, to really make someone reliant, fearful, um, that they can't leave, that there's no one else who can help them, that they won't be able to get the care that they need without this person. Um, so yeah, I think that's about my my 10 or 11 minutes there. I went just a little bit over. So I'm gonna turn stop sharing and turn things back over, but I think we'll have time for questions at the end and I'm happy to answer them then or if you wanna follow up with me after the presentation. Oh, I think you're muted, Bill. Thank you so much. I, that was really great. I, I, um, I think that we there's an awareness that the trauma of domestic violence can lead to, uh, to, to certain types of uh, disabling conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I think um, it really is useful to talk to, to be to talk about the ways that, that people who are with, who, with disabilities can be particularly targeted, victimized. Um, our, our next um expert today is um is patricia abbott from utah legal services who is going to talk a little bit about uh the criterion for receiving a, a, this ssi or ssdi federal disability assistance um and how somebody can have a disabling condition and not require for those kind of help um i think looking at the again at it's um I, I particularly when they're younger, like the parents in our hypothetical case. So I will, um, I will turn the time over to her. Okay. Well, thanks, Bill. I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is Patty Abbott, and I'm with Utah Legal Services. I'm a managing attorney over the Public Benefits Unit. Um, and yeah, this is an interesting topic because um, the people in the scenarios that Bill provided are younger individuals. Um, 25 and 22 respectively. And age matters in social security disability determinations. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute, um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to give a quick overview. Um, like Melissa, I'm not quite sure, you know, what the level of overall familiarity is with social security disability and the different programs. So we're gonna run through that really quickly. Um, I have a PowerPoint as well, but I'm, I'm having some technical problems today and I'm on my phone because I, anyway, I just have, I have a brand new computer and I, it's not running everything like it's supposed to. So I'm sorry. Um, but so yeah, let's talk, let's talk SSI versus SSDI. Um, how familiar is everybody with those two programs? Because I think those are going to be the major programs for which our hypothetical individuals may be eligible. Um, so SSDI, um, or Social Security Disability Insurance, is based on work history. Um, so I should say um, the medical criteria for eligibility for either SSI or SSDI is exactly the same. Um, and so the difference between eligibility for those programs is work history, essentially. Um, and for for social security disability, um, it's based on work credits. Um, so social security considers that for each year you're fully employed, um, you earn four quarters of credit towards your disability insurance status. Um, so if you have 40 quarters of credit over the last 10 years, you're considered fully insured. If you have less than that, then you may be eligible for less money per month when you're ultimately determined to be disabled. But if you have very little work history, then you're not going to be eligible for SSDI at all. Um, and so the only other option for individuals without much work history um, or maybe really young individuals um, is would be SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. And that is just based on financial need. Um, and so for that, you have to be um, asset and income eligible. So where that affects a lot of people, so in our, so in our first hypothetical example, you have the 25-year-old single mother. Now, 
there is a, a child's father somewhere in the picture there, right? And, and eligibility for the child's mother who does suffer some conditions such as PTSD, maybe some mental health conditions, back impairment, um, that may depend on if the father is paying child support because child support um, is considered unearned income, but it's, um, it's, it, it affects your financial or a claimant's financial eligibility for SSI. Now it won't affect your eligibility for SSDI if you're eligible for that, but say, say our hypothetical single mother is, is not, she hasn't done a lot of work. Um, maybe she's had a couple of unsuccessful work attempts, um, but you know, hasn't earned sufficient quarters of credit for insurance under SSDI. Well, then she's looking at SSI. So maybe dad is responsible and he's stepping up and he's paying $1,200 a month in child support. Well, uh, social security regulations say that two thirds of that child support amount will be deemed to the mother as unearned, unearned income and will affect her eligibility for SSI ultimately. So keep that in mind. But you know, a lot of times, maybe dad's not paying child support um, or maybe it's really sporadic. So you know, maybe she's gotten it twice over the last three years or maybe dad's incarcerated, um, something like that then she will be eligible potentially for SSI. Um, so just keep in mind, um, there's asset and income limitations. Um, in order to qualify for SSI, um, if an individual, so say, say this individual mom is trying to work. So she's got a part-time job at Maverick as a cashier. Um, you know, she's working 10 hours a week or, you know, I don't know if they would allow that, but say she's earning 750 a month. Okay, um, then technically speaking, she could still be eligible for SSI or SSDI um, because as long as you are under an earning cap of 1350 per month, you can still be income eligible um, or you can still technically be eligible for social security disability payments. Um, social security determines that if you earn over 1350 a month, you're categorically ineligible because they say that you're earning what's called substantial gainful activity. And they just say, nope, that person's capable of working 40 hours a week or is earning substantial gainful activity. Therefore, they are categorically not disabled. So just keep in mind that for 2022, that amount changes every year, but 1350 is the magic number for 2022. But say mom is working less than that. Maybe she's at um, Desert Industries. She's you know, in a sheltered employment setting and is earning some income, but it's not it's not substantial gainful activity. <clears throat> that will not make her ineligible for SSI, SSDI. Um, okay, so that's kind of a quick overview of the two programs. Now, um, I do, I should mention, does anybody know the definition of disability under social security disability law? Um, it, it means an inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity um, by reason of a medically determinable physical or mental impairment that can be expected to result in either death or will last 12 continuous months. Um, now, that's, you know, that's a lot of jargon, uh, you know, kind of legalese there, but keep in mind um, 12 continuous months. So say mom has a condition, um, it, you know, a back condition, she injured herself at, at work and uh, you know, right now she's hurting, but the doctor says, hey, do some physical therapy. You should be okay in three months. Guess what? She's not going to be eligible for social security disability based on that. Um, that's not going to meet the durational requirement. Um, or say that, um, say that she's got this, you know, this injury at work, but she also has long-term mental health conditions. So not only does she have the you know, the injury, but she's in treatment for, uh, you know, she has major depressive disorder. She's got generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety. She has trouble leaving the house. Okay, now we're talking. Mom could very well qualify for social security disability. So they take a look at not just physical impairments, not just mental impairments, but it's the combination. And cumulatively, do those render an individual unable to engage in substantial gainful activity for at least 12 continuous months? Um, I should also make a caveat. Um, so say this individual, say she's got cancer, 
and you think, whoa, okay, mom's definitely going to qualify for social security disability payments. It depends if, if she can have a surgery that's going to resolve it and maybe she's going to have chemotherapy, but the duration of chemotherapy is less than 12 months. Social security will not approve her based on cancer alone. So there's, uh, I have, there's a lot of factors that social security takes into account. And so sometimes you think, oh, this person really ought to qualify, but that durational requirement is always going to be there. Um, okay, we also mentioned age. So the individuals in this hypothetical are young, 22, 25 respectively. Um, the way social security um, evaluates age is that the older you are, the more likely you are to be found disabled. So say an individual has the same set of impairments. So this individual in the hypothetical can lift 30 pounds, right? Well, she lifts, if she's 25 and can lift 30 pounds, great, because 30 pounds at age 25 renders her capable of working probably medium level exertional work. And at medium, so medium, it's, it's all defined in social security law, but very heavy work would be like a hundred pounds. Like can a person lift and carry hundred pounds? Heavy work is 50 pounds and above. Um, 20 to 50 pounds is gonna be medium level work. Um, 20 pounds occasionally, um, 10 pounds continuously is gonna be light work. Less than 10 pounds is going to be sedentary work. So keep in mind, there's all of these categories, but okay mom falls into a medium exertional category, she's 25 years old, she's not disabled because they're going to say, nope, there's work in the economy she can perform it at 25. But same individual, say she's 60 years old, definitely disabled with a maximum residual functional capacity for, for medium work. 55 years old, still disabled. So, um, so there, it's, there's something called the medical vocational guidelines, otherwise known as the GRIDS. And it's all the scale that um, you look at what's the maximum amount, amount of exertional work they can do and then the age. And also education, work experience, um, literacy, language, those are all factors to take into account. So, I mean, even, say mom, mom is an immigrant. Say she, she doesn't speak fluent English. Um, maybe she has less than a sixth grade education in her home country hypothetically. Ooh, okay. Now that's going to get your lawyer's attention. They're going to say, aha, I can work with that because, um, because according to this, this grid system that I mentioned, that may put her in a different category. Um, so those are factors that are, are will favorably dispose her case to, to a finding of disability. But if this is a 25 native English speaker, 25 year old native English speaker, say she's done a, she has a high school degree or a GED. Nope. That's not going to get her anywhere. So just just keep in mind, um, those are all factors that that you know might affect an individual's um, eligibility for social security disability. Um, now, I I don't want to keep going on. Is there anything specific you'd like me to address, Bill? Besides what I've mentioned, I I think you did a really great job. I I think the the um, what I what I was hoping you could do, and I think you did, is that it's eligibility. I think you did it really well. It is eligibility for um, for SSI and SSDI is is not as simple as some people believe. That it's complicated, and that the younger you are, that the bigger the assumption is that you're going to be able to find work. Um, you'll be able to retrain. You're young enough to get trained, and uh, that's that's the assumption. Um, so even if you know there's there the uh, and I mean part of that was when the uh, those programs were created. There was the assumption that younger people would qualify for the AFTC Aid for Families with Dependent Children, which has since been converted into the, the Temporary Aid for Needy Families program, which has time limits that weren't in place with with when uh, that when uh, when the SSI and SSDI were created. And so I, I think um, it's um, there's some history behind that assumption that there was a program for younger families. And I suppose we, if for this panel, we're really gonna be complete, we'd talk about AFTC or TANF a little bit, but I thought that given the topic, the, 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 um, that we're talking about helping people with disabilities who become homeless, homeless parents who become homeless, disability, with parents with disabilities who become homeless, 
one path is 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 the TANF program, and hopefully they haven't used up their their three year time limit. Um, but there's specifically programs for helping uh, people with disabilities be able to improve their their employment outcomes. And we have um, Aaron Thompson, who's the director of the uh, vocational rehabilitation, uh, here to talk about uh, what what the some state programs that help with that. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Are you able to see my slides okay? Yeah. All right. Well, my name is Aaron Thompson. I'm the director of the Vocational Rehabilitation Program, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our program services, the eligibility process, and how you could connect someone who might benefit from what we're able to offer. Um, with vocational rehabilitation, our goal and mission is to help people with disabilities obtain employment and increase their independence. We're really looking at what is right for that individual, the level or capacity that they're able to work, and also what independence looks like for that person. Um, we work with people with all ability types. They could be someone starting at age 14 who's in special education, or someone who's in their 60s or 70s and they're towards the end of their career, but they still need to work and they're not able to physically or mentally do what they were previously doing before. Or an individual could be a single parent or mom who was a homemaker who was never able to participate in the workforce. Um, as the earlier presenter was giving an overview of disability, that's one of the core criteria that we look at when someone's eligible for services. When people come to VR, most of them don't identify as having a disability. And sometimes that word disability can be a bit intimidating. Um, for our program and services, they don't have to meet the level of a social security disability determination. We're really looking at some of those core physical or mental conditions that limit their participation in a major life activity. For example, breathing, walking, hearing, seeing, sleeping, taking care of oneself, performing manual tasks, or even working. So I just included some examples of when we're talking about disability, what this can mean. The range from any type of mental health, substance abuse, um, cognitive disabilities, how someone learns, um, anything intellectual, or physical injury, accident, sensory impairment. So someone is deaf, hard of hearing, or blind, we serve the whole spectrum of those services. So when looking at the examples that were provided, the single mother who has PTSD and depression, um, that's an individual who would potentially qualify for services. Or with a single father, there wasn't anything implicitly stating regarding a disability, but a lot of people have those features or symptoms that have affected their ability to work, finish school, where I would still recommend referring them to our program, especially with the single father, being in foster care as a child, there's the possibility of some trauma that's affected him through his adult life. And even he didn't finish his education program, he doesn't have a high school diploma. There's always the potential that there could be some learning disabilities there. So when we look at our criteria, um, an individual, they'll come in, they'll meet with the vocational rehabilitation counselor to review medical records and do an initial interview. That's the opportunity to sit down and talk with the counselor about their background, um, things that have affected them with school or employment. And since these are sensitive topics, you know, they're meeting with a licensed professional VR counselor in private confidential offices. If someone has a diagnosis like the single mother, we can do a records request and get that to help for um, eligibility determination. Or if they have no records, one of the great things about our program is we will pay for that. We will give them options to meet with a a psychologist, a physician, get them connected so we can review the assessment results and see if they have a significant physical or mental barrier. And then we look at how does that disability affect them in terms of being able to maintain employment or obtain it. And then the last criteria is, do they require our services and is their goal to become employed? If you meet one and two, meeting three or four, pretty natural in that sequence for VR eligibility. Um, with VR, we have, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot of gray area. Everything that we do when we're meeting with the client is based off of their individual needs. So when they're sitting down with their counselor, they're going to ask about their interests, any limitations, what they want to do. Our goal isn't just to get them a job. We really want to set them up for a long-term career path. And every VR plan looks a little bit different. It just depends on their need. 
That's why our core service is providing the counseling and guidance, really developing a relationship with your counselor. And as mentioned before, we can pay for a diagnostic evaluation. Um, in the first example, the single mother, she had like a back issue. We could do some other testing to see how that might affect her vocational options that she might be pursuing. Whenever we're guiding them to, we wanna make sure that we're setting themselves up for success for a job that they can do. Um, we can also pay for medical and treatment services. And working with the counselor, we're going to see what type of comparable benefits they're available for. And we'll also help them apply for services through other workforce services programs, being if they qualify for any type of medical assistance, food stamps, or also TANF for temporary like cash assistance. But let's say VR will pay or medication management or also any type of prescriptions that they have. Um, we can also pay for assistive technology. That's any type of device or equipment that they need. So if there's a software program that will help them in school for like note taking, if they need an ergonomic chair, we can provide that for school or in the workforce. Again, there's a lot of things that we can do with some individualized assessments that we do within the VR program through our Utah Center of Assistive Technology. Mm -hmm. The next area is really looking at what are their education and training needs. Um, the single father in scenario two did not have a high school diploma or GED. That's going to be one of the first areas that we can help him with, finding a program so he can get that milestone and then determining in order to achieve his long-term career goal, do we need to connect him with a, a trade program? Do either of those individuals in the scenario want to pursue a bachelor's level education. In some cases, we can even pay up to a graduate level program. It really just depends on what that person's need is and if they need VR assistance to achieve it. Some of the individuals we're working, their priority is just to find stable employment. Others, we know that they're going to need help with those educational milestones. So we will help people with the GED. We will help with the associates or if they wanna get a certificate or if it's even higher education. After that point, we will pair them with an employment specialist or a job coach to find them the position that we helped prepare them for. That's all the help with the, the resume skills, interviewing, giving them job leads, and even going out and advocating or connecting employers on their behalf. I think that's one of the great programs that we can offer is really finding the fit that's going to help them adapt or transition back into the workforce. And also we have our employment specialists who can talk to the employers or help prepare that individual to self-advocate. If there's something that they need and they don't know how to ask their employer about it, that's something that VR can help with. Another thing that we look at with our program is our support services. So we can provide temporary um, transportation assistance if the parents need a bus pass or gas vouchers to get to any of the doctor's appointments or school, VR can help with that. We can do some very short-term um, rent assistance, but our goal would be to see if they're eligible for services through the other parts of the Department of Workforce Services. Clothing is another big thing. If someone doesn't have it, if they've been experiencing homelessness, we can provide them with vouchers to get clothing for school, daily life, and also for employment so that they can go to the interview and land the job. And if there is any type of criminal background, you know, we partner with the Clean Slate Act and Rasa Utah to help with any of those expungement fees. So that's the broad overview of the VR services that we can provide. We're really looking at those individual needs to set that person up for success. Applying for VR, very simple and straightforward. You can go online at jobs.utah.gov forward slash USOR forward slash VR. We have an office locator. Um, we have offices all the way from Logan down to St. George throughout the state. They would come in and do an orientation session, which is just 10 minutes to give an overview of what VR is, getting an application, and then getting scheduled to meet with a counselor um, as some people might have experienced trauma, homelessness, or domestic violence, if they have a preference on gender for the counselor that they meet with, they can talk about that with the person who's assigning them for orientation. We really want them to feel comfortable when they come in and start working with their VR counselor. 
And then, as I said before, we're going to work with them to do a records request, get that diagnostic information. Um, typically eligibility for our program, we're doing that in less than 30 days, and then also getting them in after they're eligible to develop that plan, we're able to do that pretty quick. But if someone needs time to really explore what their options are, that's something else that we can help them with. And something tying back to our last presenter is if someone is on social security benefits for their disability, they are automatically eligible. We can just get confirmation of that and expedite the process. And on the other side, once someone has maybe had to go through the very difficult process of getting on social security benefits, there's a lot of fear and apprehension about return to work. That's why we have the Utah um, benefits planners who will work with them, educating them on work incentives so they know that they can try going back to work where they don't have to have that fear of apprehension about losing their benefits. There's a lot of things that we can do to let them know that you can do a trial work period and there's other incentives out there. So that's just the broad overview. You can learn more about VR by visiting the link that's right there on the screen and I'm happy to send this presentation over to Bill. So that is the quick VR in a nutshell. Thank you so much. I um, about how long do uh... How long do people receive, can, can people receive uh, services through Voc Rehab? With the VR program, there is no cap. I mean, ideally, you know, we want to make someone work through the process as fast or as appropriate. But if we're working with someone who's 14, they might be with us until they complete all of their training or could be even longer. But again, there's no limit on how long they can be a client. We do have participation expectations that they'll work with their counselor on setting up in their individualized plan. And there's no upper limit on a certain expenditure threshold. Wow, okay. Um, Pastor Vanetta Golfin Wilkerson asked if this VR services uh, help a person with, with a job but experiencing new difficulties keeping that job. Yes, if someone is employed, but they have a, a medical, physical issue that's affecting them, refer them. A lot of the people that we're working with, it's about maintaining their employment. Or if you or any employers that you know of want to hire people with disabilities, or if they're struggling and retaining, we also provide services to the employers to help them. But if they're employed and struggling, refer them to VR. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that's, um, I think, I think that that the, the Voc Rehab is a program that people may have heard of, but a lot don't know how many different things you do. I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, I, I didn't realize that you, I didn't know that you did so much stuff to help diagnose, uh, or to uh, assess problems. I think, uh, maybe part of, I was glad you noticed the second, uh, household had potential disabling conditions that had not been diagnosed. I, I, it's hard to imagine that somebody who was homeless with his mother for three years and then was in, in foster care didn't have any kind of trauma. I mean, got through trauma-free, no, no mental health issues. That's the word we really want to get out. I think to your point, someone may have seen a doctor five years ago, or maybe it was in high school when they had like an assessment done. Refer, we'll pay for that, we'll help. That's all things that we can cover and there's no contribution for those services needed. Yeah, that's, I think, um, that's really, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for having me. I, um, we've, we've been taking questions from the audience. We were supposed to, before we started this thing, we, we were trying to do a, an introduction to eat to a, a different congregation that's involved with Cork each month and Levy, Woodruff um, has agreed to come in and tell us something about First United Methodist Church in Salt Lake City. So um, I, I've I skipped her at the beginning, and so she's still with us. So thank you for what, what do you what do you got to tell us about? Well, I will try and be quick. So thanks for the, the opportunity. Uh, so First United Methodist in Salt Lake City. Um, probably the, the way that I found out about Cork was through Crossroads, and I believe that um, the the United Methodist Women, as it was called then at First Church, was were one of the founding organizations of the Crossroads Food Pantry back in 1966. Um, and we have a, a member, longtime member of First Church who's on the board. And um, we 
uh, engage in the golden celery competition every year and have, I think we actually won it last year, uh, when of, or jointly won with Centenary United Methodist Church, our, our sister congregation, um, and have done that for several years. Um, so we've got a longstanding commitment to crossroads. Um, and I think all, all of our pastors, I think for as long as I've been there, have, have frequently participated with Quark's um, initiatives and, you know, clergy days on the hill and um, other things of that nature. Uh, we also were one of the founding congregations of the Salt Lake City Affiliate of Family Promise. Um, many of you on here, I'm sure, either participate with Family Promise or at least have heard of it, but just in case anyone hasn't, um, it's a national program that has local affiliates and they house uh, families experiencing homelessness. Um, the model that we used here uh, was that they, the families are housed in area churches and they get to sleep there and they get um, meals served at night and um, you know, items for breakfast in the mornings and they have private rooms. So it's not like um, having to live in a, a congregate shelter environment that can be harder um, if you're a family with children. And then they also receive case management services. Um, they have access to a day center where they can receive mail um, have computers to do uh, job applications or housing searches. Um, they get, if the kids need to be enrolled in school, if they need uh, vaccines, anything like that, they can get assistance with that. And then they also create an individualized plan to get uh, transitioned back into housing. And then the program offers transitional housing um, for folks who graduate from the emergency shelter program, but aren't um, quite prepared to um, go back to market-based housing. And then they also offer two years of follow-up care once you complete all of that. Um, and there, the, this, this area is looking at ways that we can um, expand or maybe change our, our model to, to serve more families. So it's, it's definitely in a, a growth and a growth and change moment, but um, that's a, a longstanding commitment of First Churches and something we still do. And then we also, um, I think for three years up until the time of COVID, hosted a um, community breakfast every Sunday morning where anyone was welcome to attend. And, and many of the folks who came in um, were folks who were unsheltered, um, who either kind of spent time in the neighborhood or back when the, the road home was downtown would come from the road home. And um, what they often told us was that um, much more important than the food was the opportunity for community and fellowship um, to see your friends and have time to sit and talk with them and um, work on those relationships and be in a place that you knew was was safe for you and was not going to kind of hustle you on with, within a short term. And we are also looking at restarting that now that um, COVID is, I guess, at least somewhat better under control. And we're that is definitely a, a program that we love doing and are wanting to restart. So we, um, because of our unique situation, we're at the corner of 2nd South and 2nd East in downtown Salt Lake. We really do uh, have a strong commitment to um, that kind of ministry, um, especially outreach with folks who are unsheltered or just outreach with, with folks who are struggling economically in the, the city setting. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're in an area that's surrounded by luxury apartments, but um, very little affordable housing. Um, so we are, um, in addition to the, the programs that we have done, we're actually going through what we're calling a, a visioning process right now, where we're looking for other ways that um, we can get involved with efforts just to support those of our neighbors who have um, greater economic need or just, or more, more needs of that area, but more ways to be involved. So that's, that's kind of us. Thank you. I, I, um, I think it's good. So for everybody here about what different congregations are up to, um, I, uh, does anybody, if anybody has a last question, you can raise your hand in the attendee section is, um, thank you so much to each of our panelists. I, I think, um, I mean, I, I learned more than I was expecting to learn. I'm, I'm really grateful, uh, I think. And uh, so next month we will be, again, talking about on August 10th at 1 p.m., we'll be talking about uh, how, what, you know, what could be done to make it easier for congregations that have a property that where they could look, build a, a tiny home or an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, but anyway, so our, one of our panelists has something to say. You raised that. It looks like there were a couple of questions in the chat about VR that I'm happy to answer. Oh, please do. Um, first, is there a wait list for vocational rehabilitation services? No, there is not. Um, we used to be what's on an order of selection, but we are no longer. So if someone comes in, their application will be processed within 30 days. The next question is, is this the same program as the at the Judy M. Buffmeyer building? So 
That's where I'm located at the Buffmeyer building. That's our administration office, but we have offices across the state. Half of them are co-located in employment centers, but if you go on the website and type in your zip code, it will tell you the VR office that you can go to in your community. And I think that's all of them. All right, thank you. Um, well, I think that, oh, there's somebody raising a hand now. Um, I don't see who it is. Maybe. Huh. Okay, well, maybe it was. Okay, the hand is down. So I will, um, I think we'll end the meeting and uh, just thank you so much for your time, everyone.